Welcome, my dear students, to this Chapter 7 continuing coverage of periodic trends. In this video, I'm going to teach you about electron configurations and ionization energy. To start this one, however, I would like to share with you a hilarious chemistry cat of the day taken from quickbeam.com. It says, two men walk into a bar. The first orders some H2O. The second one says, sounds good. I'll have some H2O too. The second one dies. <laughs> ah. If you don't get that, think about it a little bit. And if necessary, I'll explain it in class. All right, so after this video and a few that follow, they'll all be linked to one after the other in the video description. You will gain the following skills. First, knowing what an isoelectronic series is. Second, deriving electron configurations of ions. Third, knowing periodic table trends in ionization energies and using them to sort examples. Fourth, knowing periodic table trends in electron affinities and using that to sort examples in electron affinity. And last, being familiar with some physical and chemical characteristics of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. And of course, we will skip sections 7.7 .7 and 7.8 from our text, which is referenced in the description below. Let's then get into it, beginning with isoelectronic series. So as it turns out, different ions of different elements can have the same number of electrons. Not the same number of protons, but the same number of electrons. For example, the falling ions all have the same number of electrons. And you're welcome to look at the periodic table now to see if you can figure out why. Now, a series of different ions that all have the same number of electrons as each other is called an isoelectronic series, which takes us to a beautiful problem. What is an isoelectronic series? And which neutral atom is isoelectronic with each of these elements? And as a follow-up, which of these ions is smaller? Fluoride, that is F minus, or sodium cation, Na plus? Now, I invite you to try this on your own, and then if you like, you can click the link that's hopefully floating over my head somewhere or in the description below to a separate video in which I will answer it for you. Now that we've got that done, let's press on. So just as we do with neutral atoms, we can derive the electron configurations of ions, that is, atoms that are charged because they've gained or lost electrons. For example, if we were asked to give the electron configuration of sodium cation, here's what we would do. We would first write down the electron configuration of neutral sodium, Na, which happens to be this right here. Now, I have a link in the description below to a video from a previous chapter in which I explained to you how to do this, electron configurations of neutral atoms. Second, starting at the outermost orbital, which in this case is the 3s orbital, we remove whatever number of electrons have been removed in order to get to the charge of our ion. In this case, it's sodium plus. So we've only removed one electron. So we're going to take it away from the outermost 3s orbital. You'll see that this 3s has a 1 above it, which means that a neutral sodium has one electron in its outermost 3s orbital. To get to sodium cation, we remove that electron. So there are no electrons in the 3s orbital anymore. And what is left over, which is this thing right here, is the electron configuration of Na+. Make sense? Good. You should notice, of course, that sodium plus has the same electron configuration as neutral neon. Thus, sodium plus and neutral neon are isoelectronic. This, of course, takes us to a beautiful sample problem in which I want you to write the electron configurations for the ions shown right here. I, of course, have a link floating over my head, maybe, or in the description below, which will take you to a separate video where I answer this question. Is that good and happy? <laughs> good. Then we must go onward to ionization energy. So ionization energy is the amount of energy required to strip an electron from an atom. Even for elements like sodium, which really want to get rid of their outermost valence electron, it still takes energy to remove that electron. Now that energy cost is once again called the ionization energy for that particular atom. So what is the trend for ionization energy on the periodic table? Well, to answer this, I'd like to review electronegativity, which I discussed in an earlier video in a prior chapter and is linked to in the description below. You might remember that generally speaking, an atom's electronegativity, which is its thirst for electrons, increases as you go up and to the right on the periodic table, excluding the noble gases. Thus, fluorine is the most electronegative element and francium is the least. Now, keeping in mind the fact that fluorine wants electrons the most, and francium wants electrons the least, as well as the fact that ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron for an atom, from which element on the periodic table do you think it should be the hardest to take an electron away? Yeah, you would think it would be fluorine, right? It's the most electronegative, the greediest for electrons, so it would be hardest to take an electron away from fluorine. And by extension, from which element would it be the easiest? Yeah, you would assume it would be francium. And these assumptions would be reasonable. However, as it turns out, noble gases actually do count when you're talking about ionization energy, because you can take electrons away from noble gases. 
It's just very hard. Other than that, ionization energy follows the same general trend as electronegativity. That is, it increases as you go up and to the right on the periodic table. Except, as I just mentioned, unlike electronegativity, we actually do include noble gases. Thus, helium has the highest ionization energy and francium does indeed have the lowest. Make sense? Good. Now, you'll notice that this trend is the opposite of the trend for atomic radius or atom size that I discussed earlier. And why is that? The reason is because it's more difficult to remove an electron when an atom is smaller because the electron is closer to that atom's positively charged protons in its nucleus. Thus, as an atom gets smaller, ionization energy gets bigger. So believe it or not, it's actually possible to remove more than one electron from an atom. An atom's first ionization energy is of course the amount of energy required to remove its first electron. Its second ionization energy is the amount of energy required to move its second electron and so forth. <laughs> so is an atom's first ionization energy larger than its second or is it the other way around? And what about the third? Well, as it turns out, each successive ionization energy, that is first followed by second, followed by third and so forth is larger than the previous one. So an atom's first ionization energy is smaller than its second, its second is smaller than its third and so forth. However, once an atom feels like a noble gas, that is once it gets to a charge where it has the same configuration as a noble gas, then the ionization energy after that point is really huge. So you might wonder why? Well, the reason is because the atom feels like a noble gas. And as I've discussed elsewhere, feeling like a noble gas is every element's dream. It has that perfect Goldilocks balance between the right number of electrons and the right number of protons. Thus, it feels just right. Therefore, once an atom arrives at a noble gas state, it doesn't want to lose any more electrons. And we can see that trend right here, beginning with the successive ionization energy of sodium. As you can see, ionization energy one, that is the amount of energy required to remove sodium's first electron, is a certain number. But after it's done that, it's now a sodium plus, and it will feel like neon, which is the noble gas above argon. In other words, once you've removed sodium's first electron, it now has a noble gas configuration. So what do you think its second ionization energy is? That is the amount of energy required to remove a second electron? Yeah, it's, holy crap, it's huge. You see why? Because at this point, it has a noble gas configuration. It does not want to lose another electron. Logically then, magnesium being in column two has ionization energy one and then two, and now feels like a noble gas because it's lost two electrons, which hopefully explains why its third ionization energy is, whoa, super huge by comparison. Analogously then, aluminum's ionization energies one, two, and three are successively larger, but at this point, it now feels like a noble gas neon being aluminum three plus, which means that its fourth ionization energy, the amount of energy required to remove a fourth electron is super huge. And I don't have to talk you through the rest. Hopefully all of these numbers that you see make sense. And I've drawn a little wall here to indicate where the next ionization energy involves removing an electron beyond a noble gas configuration. And you can see that on the right side of this wall for each of these elements, the numbers are very large, comparatively speaking. This table taken from our text shows the same thing, which takes us to a lecture question, which I invite you to just answer on your own for fun. Why in the world do you think that comparatively speaking, the first ionization energy for sodium is so small? And why is the second one so large? Furthermore, referring to the periodic table, please arrange the following atoms in order of increasing first ionization energy. And although it's kind of cheating, sort of, I guess, this table actually shows the ionization energies in units of kilojoules per mole for different elements on the periodic table. This YouTube video up here, which I've linked in the description below and may be floating over my head right now, I'm not completely sure, comes from a different YouTuber, but also showcases this trend beautifully. We end then with a couple of final problems right here, which I'm not gonna read to you because there's a lot of words, but I'll instead invite you to read and try on your own. Then if you like, you can click the links in the description below or floating over my head somewhere that will take you to separate videos in which I answer each of these questions for you. Until then, my wonderful students, thank you so much for watching. Please have a wonderful rest of your day.